This is the Transportation Planning Policy Committee, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Stan. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> yep. Yeah. David Couch. Kyle Blades. Present. Daniel Borelli. Present. John Crump. Here. Alex Garcia. Present. Sally Gonzalez. Present. Orshel Cryer. Here. Nick Lucinovich. Kathy Prout. Yes, here. Zach Scrivener. Here. Bob Smith. I am here. Philip Smith. Here. And Veronica Vasquez. Here. John Kersey. Here. Ruben Pascal. Ruben Pascual. Michael Navarro. Here. And Danae Alcala. Here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the council. Council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the council at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? I see none here. Do we have any online? We have none. So, Mr. Brian Godby will be in attendance virtually to present the 2021 Community Survey Final Report. Mr. Godby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased to be here again to present the results of our annual uh, survey for uh, current council governments. Uh, and jumping into this, uh, should all be able to see the presentation, I t assume. Uh, the methodology is the first slide. Um, and again, as in the last few years, the data collection has been telephone and online interviewing. Our universe has been uh, adults 18 plus. That's about 461,000 residents in Kern, <clears throat> in Kern County. Uh, we were in the field uh, from the very end of January to the middle of February. Um, our average interview length was about 22 minutes on the phone. Uh, we still use that as the metric for ga gauging how long a survey is, uh, although some people take it uh, in a much shorter time or a longer time on the phone, as well as online, um, the same is true. 
Uh, the final sample size, we were shooting for 1,200. We wound up with 1,515. Uh, that's an artifact, if you will, of doing the online survey. Uh, we can uh, leave the online running while we work on getting the, the hard to get strata uh, by making phone calls, uh, both cell and landline, to targeting those particular people that we need to, to reach. Uh, of the total, 89 interviews were conducted in Spanish, uh, and all that gives us a margin of error of plus or minus 2.51%, uh, plus or minus again. <clears throat> Moving into a brief uh, overview of the data, uh, Kern County uh, garnered slightly higher favorable rating um, this year, which uh, is a new question for us, uh, in response to the state or is the county doing a favorable or unfavorable job in managing the coronavirus crisis? Uh, it's a question that it, we really felt uh, for the last 14 months we've had to ask because it's been the elephant in the room. Uh, and uh, the state was um, a little lower than we've seen in other communities. The county was a little lower, but it was higher than the state. Um, and we think that's a, a good sign. Uh, slightly um, lower satisfaction uh, with the overall quality of life in Kern County, though, in, than in 2020, uh, and slightly fewer residents believe the quality of life in their city or town will be better in the next 20 years, uh, that was lower as well. As we've done these kinds of surveys throughout the state in the last uh, 12 months, we've seen that phenomena because of the COVID crisis everywhere. Uh, so it's hard to tell what's, you know, what's driving that, probably the crisis uh, for all the obvious reasons. Uh, we asked a couple of open-ended questions. Uh, one, the first one was what they liked most about their town and the highest scoring responses were cost of living is low, uh, the small town atmosphere and the cost of housing is low. Uh, on the other hand, for the least like uh, question, Homelessness, crime rate, and air quality were the highest responses, things that people were concerned with. Uh, tracking with past surveys, we asked um, 20 various items and asked them how important they thought they would be to the future quality of life in the county. Uh, and the top seven items you see here, uh, quality of education, preserving water supply, crime prevention and gang prevention, uh, improving water quality, maintaining local streets and roads, creating high paying jobs and improving air quality were the top items that they thought would contribute to uh, future quality of life. Uh, in the current survey, 76% uh, said that they typically drive alone uh, and that's combining as we have for the last several years, drive alone and autonomous self-driving car, which is also drive alone. Uh, with respect to the commute behavior during the pandemic, approximately one third of the respondents said they had been telecommuting or working from home during the COVID crisis. Uh, and we also found that about a third of those said that they would continue doing that. Uh, so that's about 10% uh, 10, 10 or so uh, of the whole population will continue to work, to, to work from home while they were working, uh, obviously, in the, their location, their workplace before the crisis began. Uh, about one in five res, uh, respondents said that they their company is requiring them to work from home. Uh, and uh, about a third said that they would prefer to telecommute in the future because of the time and money savings. Uh, respondents in general were more positive than in 2020 with um, traffic flow. Uh, than they had been in previous years. So that's a, a good, obviously, with a third of the population not working or commuting to work, uh, they, uh, that obviously has a big impact. Uh, if available, a majority said they would continue driving alone. Uh, well, only 8% said they would opt for an electric vehicle or charging station, or if charging stations were available or uh, would carpool or vanpool as an alternative to driving alone. 
Uh, then, oops, next slide. There we go. Uh, respondents ha had a slim preference for allowing the testing of autonomous vehicles. Uh, self-driving trucks on Kern County roads, 47% uh, said that they would be in favor versus only 43% opposed. Uh, and the most successful argument uh, in favor of the proposal was that it would be cleaner and more environmentally friendly. Uh, when asked about their current type of housing, 46% of residents uh, said that they uh, live in a single family home with a large yard in comparison, 36% indicated they reside in a single family home with a small yard, 13% uh, for an apartment, 3% for townhouse, and just one-tenth one of a percent in multi-use buildings. Uh, the largest group of respondents, 83%, yes, definitely yes, and probably yes, said they would prefer a large, uh, large yard family home, single family home if they were to purchase something in the future. Uh, and finally, to summer, in summary, the vast majority of respondents, 81%, said they had no awareness of the concept of accessory dwelling units. Only 11% said that they had seen or heard about them. Uh, among the renters that we surveyed, uh, about 35% said that they would be willing to consider renting an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and among owners, about 43%. Uh, I'm sorry, about a third said that they would consider building or renting out an accessory dwelling unit. So that's a quick summary. Now we'll go a little bit more into the details uh, of what we're talking about. As I mentioned at the outset, one of the new questions that we've been asking everywhere is the favorable, unfavorable view of how the COVID crisis has been handled. About 39% think that it's been handled favorably at the state level and about 46% uh, think it's been favorably handled at the county level. Uh, that the state is among the lowest that we've seen in the last year, uh, and the county is among the lower group uh, in terms of their favorable or unfavorable rating there. Uh, this next slide shows a lot of data about the quality of life uh, in the um, County and uh, basically we looked at very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, and very dissatisfied. The green and the gold are the very and somewhat satisfied. If you were to do the quick math, you'd see that 51% in round numbers are satisfied with the quality of life in 2021. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen that a drop um, since 2020 from 62, but we've seen that a similar drop throughout the state. Uh, I mean, they, the COVID crisis obviously has taken a toll on people's perception of quality of life. Uh, having said that, in 2019, we were at 67%. In 2018, we were at 72%. and 2017, we were at 84 in round numbers. Uh, so there's been a decline uh, since uh, the mid-teens um, uh, as well. The next question looked at the future quality of life, and the same thing is true here, uh, except the scale is different. The green and the golden color represent much better and somewhat better. Uh, and there's been a decline, again, I think from 20 to 21. It's be probably because of COVID, even though we're asking about future quality of life, uh, we've seen the COVID crisis has impacted both current and future perceptions. So we went from 31 in 2020 to 27 in 2021, uh, but we had declined from, well, we were about the same in 19 and 20. Uh, 2018, we were higher. Uh, and if you go down the list, we were at the highest point in 2012 at uh, 42%. Uh, this next slide shows the open-ended question that I mentioned earlier and all the data in terms of what you like most about your city or town. Uh, as I mentioned, cost of living is at the top of the list, and that's a big jump of about 11 percent since uh, 2020. So people are really happy with the cost of living in their communities. The small town atmosphere has also gone up, but statistically it's probably not significant. Uh, and the cost of housing is the same, has gone up, but probably not significant. Uh, other items that were uh, that they liked were location, sense of community, 
farming and agricultural community, natural resources, safe neighborhoods, uh, and the weather and the climate. There were a variety of other responses, uh, but they go down fairly quickly from there. And even with the margin of error, they approach zero pretty quickly. On the other side of the coin, we had the features they like least about their city or town. At the top of that list was homelessness. Uh, and that's gone from about 50, well, 52.9 to 54.3. So it's increased a percent. Statistically, that's not significant. Um, but it may be, again, a, a, uh, you know, related to the COVID crisis. Uh, the crime rate has also gone up in terms of the feature they like least from 45 to almost 50. Uh, air quality from 48 in round numbers to 49, not really a big difference. Uh, others at the top of the list are gang violence, job opportunities, or lack thereof. Uh, the COVID response uh, has obviously been a big driver, as I've said, that is shown here uh, at 29%. Lack of community resources, hospitals or social services on up a little bit from 2020. Uh, and, and that is a significant increase of about 5%. Traffic congestion, not surprisingly, as we talked about earlier, has gone down. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, a an item as well. Uh, the rest of these drop off pretty quickly. We've got growth and planning at 21%, uh, youth programs, affordable housing, uh, public transportation, uh, cost of living, et cetera. Now, as I mentioned in the summary, the top items, top seven items were uh, the, in terms of the future quality of life, we're improving the quality of education, preserving water supply, improving crime prevention and gang prevention, improving water quality, maintaining local streets and roads, creating more high paying jobs and improving air quality. Uh, the next couple slides, which I'll try to go through quickly, uh, sort of drill down on all of those things uh, and show you how this they've changed over the last five years. And the short story is they haven't changed dramatically. Uh, creating more high, high, high paying jobs has gone up slightly. Uh, encouraging new businesses to locate has gone down slightly uh, as a, an important item, but still important. Uh, oops, sorry. Revitalizing older neighborhoods has uh, basically stayed the same, uh, nominally up. Creating more affordable housing uh, is just a little bit down. It's not really statistically significant as are any of these really. Uh, they've all been relatively flat. Expanding highways slightly down, reducing traffic congestion slightly down, uh, maintaining local streets and roads slightly more important, uh, expanding local bus service slightly less important, uh, improving public transit to other cities slightly less important, and that could be a factor of COVID too, with people uh, working from home. Uh, maintaining and improving sidewalks, slightly more important. Uh, public uh, transportation and carpooling, slightly less important. Again, that could be related to COVID as well. Uh, improving air quality, just slight teeny bit down uh, in importance. Preserving water supply, um, just a teeny bit down as well. Improving water quality, virtually the same for the last three years. Preserving open space and native animal habitats up slightly uh, from 2020. And finally, developing housing options has gone down uh, slightly from 2020. Uh, and the final list of related to this question uh, was uh, improving fire and emergency medical. That's gone up slightly. Improving local health care and social services, the importance has gone down slightly. Improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs has gone down slightly in terms of its importance. And improving the quality of education uh, is down a little bit from 2020, but it's still the top of the list. The uh, next question, change, shifting gears a little bit, was what's your primary type of transportation for traveling to and from work? As I said, drive alone and a drive autonomous car, self-driving car alone 
uh, were the top combined, they were 76%. Specifically, they were 68 for drive alone and 8.2 for the autonomous self-driving car. Um, and then work from home, don't work outside of the home normally was 8.5%. Uh, obviously, we know that a third uh, of the population is now uh, saying that they will, the crisis caused them to work from home. Carpool, van pool, down a little bit from 2020. Uh, not working retired is a new category that we added this year, uh, and it's about 3%. Uh, walking, just a small couple percent, as with uh, traditional express shuttle and uh, shuttle bus electric vehicle, what you'd expect at about 1%, although with the introduction of the new Ford F-150 today, that may change next year. Um, uh, both Ford and GM obviously have made uh, inroads into that marketplace, so it'll be interesting to see how that moves. Uber and Lyft, uh, less than a percent each. Uh, bike, e-bike, and sh bike sharing at about a half percent. Taxi, negligible. Uh, and um, the remainder of the list. Uh, this next question was the specifics on, um, did you begin telecommuting or working from home during the COVID crisis? 33% said yes, 65% said no, which is still the vast majority of the population, uh, and only 2% uh, didn't have an answer. Uh, we then asked those people that were commuting uh, from home if they would continue to work from home. And about 31% of those people that are working from home because of the crisis said that they would continue. If you do the math, that means that 10.3% of the total population that were commuting previous to the crisis would continue telecommuting. So that's um, uh, certainly will likely have an impact on traffic. When we asked the people uh, why they would continue commute, telecommuting or working from home, 21% uh, said their company is requiring it. Uh, and then interestingly enough, saving money and saving time uh, is about 34%, 34.5% uh, said that that's the reason they will continue doing it. Now remember that's not of the entire population, that's of that 10% of the population that are going to continue uh, to tell you um, after the crisis is over. Uh, the next uh, item was the uh, ranking of traffic flow in their uh, city or town. And um, it's actually gone up, as I said at the outset. We're now at 38% saying that it's excellent or good. That's up from 35. It's not a lot, but it's certainly uh, what we would expect given some of the other behavior. Um, but of course, uh, we've seen the traffic get worse uh, in this slide since 2016, where we were at uh, 51, and then in 2017, we were at 56. So uh, certainly traffic is, is an issue, even though people are telecommuting. Uh, the next question we asked people who were driving alone what uh, alternative they might take, and uh, half of them said that they would continue to drive alone. 8% said electric vehicle if there were charging stations available. 6% uh, said carpool. 5%, uh, 6% in round numbers said autonomous or self-driving car, which is still driving alone, but um, uh, obviously a little bit different. Uh, express bus service at 5%, um, bike or e-bike at 4.5%. Don't work outside the home, again, is 3.7. Uh, shuttle service is 4. Traditional bus, 3. Uber, Lyft, 1. Uh, another version of e-bike sharing, This in this case sharing, not your own, uh, at 1.3. Uh, and then just bicycle at 3.6. Um, and, and these are different ways that we asked it in previous years. So that's why there seems confusing. Uh, walking only 1% uh, and on down the list. Mm -hmm. uh, the switching gears again a little bit, we asked a question, do you support or oppose the idea of testing uh, autonomous self-driving trucks in the county? Uh, it's 18.6% said they strongly support it. 
28.7 somewhat support that's a total of 47.3 on the negative side 26.4 percent strongly opposed 16.7 somewhat opposed that's a total of 4.3 43.1 sorry uh, so there is a slight plurality in favor of the testing of that uh, and the next question was um, related to that if you heard that uh, the reason to do the test would be it's clean and more environmentally friendly. Would you support it? It moves up to 57% in round numbers. Uh, autonomous vehicles can't be distracted and are safer than operator uh, driven trucks at 53 uh, and can help to reduce traffic at 54. Statistically, they're all about the same, but it is interesting that the environmental item is, is the highest of the list. And so switching gears one more time uh, into the housing section, uh, we asked people what their current housing option was uh, and 36% said uh, single family home with a, a small yard, 46% said single family home with a large yard, 3% are living in a townhouse or condominium, uh, negligible amount in a multi-use uh, building, 13% in an apartment, and 2% didn't have an uh, answer to that one. Uh, we asked them what their preference would be. Um, and in uh, this particular year, uh, the preference for a single family home with a small yard was 68%. If you add the green and the blue bar, part of the bar together, single family home with a large yard was 83 percent so people still um aspire to the sort of american ideal um at a very very high level uh townhouse or condominium was 39 percent uh multi-use building was 27 percent and apartment oops apartment was uh 32 percent uh this next chart just uh well it's a bit of an eye chart shows the same thing that uh, pretty much everybody, regardless of what um, housing they live in, prefers that um, that large uh, single family home with a large yard. Uh, the next question was just simple demographic, but we moved it up because we needed to know whether they own or rent uh, for the uh, um, the next couple questions. So 39 rent, 58 own. Uh, among those people that said they, um, well, among everybody, we asked them if they've heard about accessory dwelling units and only 11% said yes, 81% said no. Uh, when we asked the renters, which is why we asked the renter question earlier than normal, uh, we asked renters if they would consider an accessory dwelling unit as their principal residence 35% said yes, 49% said no. Um, so while it's not uh, anywhere near a majority, there's still you know a little over a third that would consider renting an accessory dwelling unit. And then we asked the other side of the, the, the issue, those people that are owners, if they would consider renting out or building an accessory dwelling unit, 34% said they would consider it 43% said they wouldn't, uh, again, still a plurality against it, but uh, a significant chunk um, said that they would consider it. And obviously that has potentially a big impact on the housing supply uh, and particularly the affordable housing supply. So those are all the uh, slides that I have for you this evening. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I have a couple. Um, the, the housing preferences for Kern County, are they the in general the same as the rest of the state or we vary? Uh, I don't really have that question for the rest of the state. That's something that's unique to you. Uh, other people may have asked that. I, I don't know, but, um, but I don't have a, a real good comparison uh, other than just comparing it over time. Uh, as we don't have that tonight, but I do have that data in the full report. So from year to year, it's been pretty stable in current. 
the the satisfaction with local government i didn't hear you mention but i thought i heard that that was going down yeah. as satisfaction with federal and state government well, yeah it's not satisfaction just with local government and i flip back to it it's do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the state's uh efforts to address the COVID crisis or do you have a favorable view of the county's uh efforts to address the crisis at a 39 percent favorable the county had a higher 46 percent favorable uh, but those are on the low end. We've asked this question in a lot of different places. Well, everywhere we've done a survey for the last 14 months, we've asked this question. And um, the, so this is on the low end. Uh, people are not relatively pleased with the uh, the response to the crisis in your county. <laughs> now, the other question was satisfaction with the quality of life. That's not with satisfaction with local government That's okay so you don't you don't really ask that question no we don't ask that directly but mm -hmm. we have asked that question in a lot of other communities we just have never done it here the adu question do you ask in other communities uh that's new uh and again unique part, part of the effort every year is to figure out what the issues are in kern county right um so that yeah okay does anybody else have any questions Hearing none, I thank you for your report. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so we will move on to the consent agenda opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken. Does any member of the public wish to remove a consent item? I see none here, none online. Any member wish to remove an item for a separate consideration? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Crump. I motion. Second. Second. Who made the motion? I did, Sally Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank okay, you. roll call vote, please. I don't Thank know, you. there was a lot of seconds. <laughs> Um, Kyle Blades. Aye. Daniel Borelli. Aye. John Crump. Yes. Alex Garcia. Aye. Sally Gonzalez. Aye. Aye. Orchel Cryer. Yes. Kathy Prout. Aye. Zach Scrivener? Aye. Bob Smith? Yes. Philip Smith? Yes. Veronica Vasquez? Veronica Vasquez. John Kersey? Yes. Ruben Pasquale? Ruben Pasquale. Yes. Thank you. And Michael Navarro. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Item number four, Federal Transportation Improvement Program, draft amendment, Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Amendment number two includes revisions to the State Highway Regional Choice Program the Regional Surface Transportation Program, Transit Program, and the Non-Motorized Program. The public review period ends tomorrow, May 21st. 
The Kern-Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on May 24th. State and federal approval is required. At this time, I ask that the chair please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Thank you. We now open the public hearing. Are there any comments? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, members. Michael Navarro with Caltrans. Sorry, let me lost my screen for a minute. My apologies. So before you start, I want to provide a couple of updates. I know it's been a few months since we talked about the Caltrans planning grants. Um, we do anticipate having announcements made uh, ideally middle of June. So hopefully I'll be able to report some, some good news next board meeting. Um, but definitely by the end of June, we should have those announcements made. I, I do believe it, it, for District 6 that, uh, within the area of Kern County, there were three applications for planning grants. Um, also a reminder, we talked previously about RAISE, which used to be the build applications. Uh, if you do have a project on the state highway system or if you're looking for a letter of support from Caltrans, well, we would need to work with you to have those submitted to our headquarters folks for review by June 16th. Um, also, just want to share May is Bike Month. Typically, Caltrans has a, kind of a robust plan where we do encourage everybody to bike to work, but obviously during telework, we're not able to do that. So we have been just encouraging people to get out and bike in the month of May, and, and the weather's been nice for it. Um, litter is always a topic. Um, you've probably seen the news, the governor's plan with Clean California. So we anticipate getting about $1.5 billion over three years, uh, which would generate about 15,000 new jobs, which we're excited about. We are looking to hire some new low barrier positions within our district to help with the litter cleanup. Just some stats to make you uh, understand the, the magnitude of the litter. In 2020, we calculated that we picked up about 267,000 cubic yards of, of litter from our highways, which was still about 18,000 garbage trucks. And, and as you know, um, it's still not enough. So thank you for continued partnership, uh, working with your local agencies and, and assisting with this effort. But um, we're hoping to approve upon that with the, with the added budget. Uh, going forward on projects, so State Route 58 Roadway Rehab Project is a gap closure project. Uh, in Bakersfield from Route 5899 to the Cottonwood Road. Overhead, overhead signs will be erected in the next couple months. The contractor continues to work on punch list items. There will be some nighttime closures over the next few weeks, and we anticipate completion of this uh, in July of this year. The Bell Terrace overcrossing of State Route 58, this project constructed auxiliary lane, replaced the bridge. This project is complete, so I will remove this from our uh, project update list. The Bakersfield Freeway Connector, this is the Route 5899 uh, modifying the interchange. Uh, work continues to progress in this project. Work is going on in various bridges uh, throughout this project, throughout the project limits. Uh, we're still reviewing the temporary detour ramp from westbound 58 to southbound 99. And as I mentioned, work is continuing on the sound walls and the drainage systems throughout the project. And we anticipate project completion in January of 2022. Uh, State Route 99 Fast Freight Corridor Project between I-5 and US 99 Overcrossing. Uh, currently, the contractor is placing rebar on State Route 99, the northbound direction of Lane 2. Uh, we expect the contract to start pouring concrete over the next week or two, and this project is scheduled for completion in the latter part of June. The State Route 99 Palm Avenue Overcrossing the Beardsley Canal Bridge. Right now, currently closed with number three and four lane and the shoulder in the southbound direction. We're continuing to uh, work on con continuous reinforced concrete pavement for the southbound direction, starting at Olive Drive and working southerly. Uh, the ramps continue to be closed. Work has begun on, on the wall that was in question previously and expect to be complete over the next couple of weeks. And tentatively, we're looking at the ramps opening in early June. There will be some night uh, some nighttime work continuing along this project. The State Route 223 Derby Signal Project, this is a safety project at the east end of Arvin. Uh, the contractor is working on securing their permits from the railroad in the city of Arvin. Once they have the permits and the railroad work is completed, the contractor will schedule constructive construction. So we're anticipating construction starting on this in June. The State Route 184 Sunset Roundabout, this project is at the intersection of State Route 184 and Sunset near Weed Patch. This project is ready to list. The PGE transmission line relocation is scheduled to start October, and we do plan to advertise this project in August. The Arvin State Route 223, State Route 184 roundabout uh, project will add a roundabout to the intersection of State Route 223 and 184. 
This project is in design, anticipated to to be ready to advertise this month. This is what this is being uh, combined with some CMAC funding in the amount of $1.5 million. Um, we've talked in the past about the Union Avenue high intensity uh, crosswalk and understanding the importance of getting this project accelerated. So the current schedule we've indicated in the past, uh, this is the, the Hawk signal system at State Route 204 and A Street as currently in design. The, the schedule we had laid out previously was February, uh, ready to advertise this in February 2022. I talked to the project manager today. We're looking at various options to accelerate this project. A lot of it contingent upon some moving parts in terms of utility relocation. Uh, we, we have laid out a plan with the opportunity, if all goes well, to hopefully save a few months off here with the utility relocation. Also, with this being a safety project, we do think that we'll be able to advertise early. We can shave another month off. We are looking at using state-issued poles. Um, the construction schedule that was laid out of the project was for August 2022. Um, we are hoping we can shave four or five months off of that, and we're really trying to aim for spring of, of 2022 on this project. We do understand the importance of the uh, pedestrian safety in this area. Um, we've also talked a lot about the bike lanes on 204, and this is something that I know it's had a lot of attention. I'm really working closely with our maintenance op folks to hopefully keep this on track. Uh, the plan is, is, is as soon as we get them out there, which is hopefully in the next few months, is have our maintenance crews go out there and, and stripe an edge line to help separate the shoulder and the, and the motor cars to give the bicyclists a little bit of um, added protection. Uh, we are also on a, on a parallel path. We, we are accelerating this to put this into our minor program for this upcoming fiscal year. Um, really encouraging them to try and do this in the first part of the fiscal year as soon as possible. So with the minor funds, we'll be able to go back and enhance those edge lines and come back in and be able to add all the signage, the stencils, and we'll be looking at opportunities at the conflict point for adding the green paint as well. So as I mentioned, I'll continue to update on a monthly basis and, and keep in touch with our uh, traffic folks and our maintenance folks to ensure this project continues to, to progress. Um, State Route 46, uh, Segment 4B, this converts the two-lane conventional highway to a four-lane facility. Uh, in and around Lost Hills. This is the project that did receive uh, build funding. That contract, that project did begin construction this month in May. We actually hosted a ribbon cutting back on May 7th. Anticipated completion for this project will be summer of 2022. And then lastly, the uh, State Route 46, uh, Segment 4C, uh, to the west of here, this is also converting a two-lane conventional highway to a four-lane facility. That project is currently in design and we're working on right-of-way acquisition. Uh, with that, that completes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I just I wanted to thank you for staying on the the Union Avenue 204. You know the Hawk and the bike lanes. That is a very dangerous section. So the the sooner the better. Appreciate your efforts. Any other comments for Caltrans District Six? Hearing none. District Nine, Caltrans. Hi, good evening, Chair and Council. Uh, a few other, a uh, few general updates for you uh, before I get into the projects. We are doing um, outreach efforts for our State Route 58 corridor management plan. This is the East Kern segment from Bealeville Road to the San Bernardino County line. So if you are contacted with a request to complete a short survey, we ask you to please fill that out. It should take 10 minutes or less, and this provides valuable input for us as we put this corridor plan together. Um, and thank you to any of those who've already participated and provided feedback. We appreciate it. I uh, just wanted to put it out there that you, um, you're you gonna get a call also in the near future from us for an innovative concept proposals in anticipation of the federal government's once in a generation investment in our national infrastructure. And so we are looking for implementable projects, demonstration projects, pioneering processes, and pilot programs. And so we'll be in touch with you in the future regarding that effort. And then I wanted to let you know that the California Transportation Commission allocated construction funding last week for the Olancha Cartago four-lane project in Inyo County, which is one of the MOU STIP projects and is the two-lane to four-lane conversion project. And we anticipate con uh, major construction on that to begin this fall. As far as projects in Eastern Kern County, the Rosamond Mojave Rehab Project continues. Uh, hot mix asphalt has been placed on the southbound lanes. The next step is to place the continuously reinforced concrete pavement. 
uh, over that, and that was projected to begin this week. However, due to the high winds, that has been delayed. So work hopefully will resume on that next week. And on and off ramps at Dawn Road, Bacchus Road, and Silver, Silver Queen Road continue to be closed in the, at this time. Um, the other project I want to mention is called uh, Mojave Digouts Project, and this is on the 14 in Mojave between Silver Queen Road and the North Junction of Business Route 58. And the project will remove and replace sections of pavement. And unfortunately, again, due to high winds this week, they were supposed to have that wrapped up this week. We're unable to do so. So hopefully there'll be completion of that project next week. And there will be some driveways, uh, just so you know, affected on the corner at State Route 14 and the Mojave Barstow Highway. And that is all I have this evening. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll move to the executive director's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. Um, last week, the California Transportation Commission met, and you may have read about um, one of their projects in the Bakersfield, California today. They actually allocated um, uh, transportation dollars to four different projects in Kern County. One was uh, State Route 119 through Pumpkin Center. One was a reimbursement to the city of Bakersfield for almost $19 million, which was significant. That was an early payback of a loan uh, that I've told you about before that Supervisor Scrivener was, uh, um, helped us um, get an agreement with the CTC almost four years ago. Emergency work on the Kern River Bridge for a million dollars and about uh, $700,000 worth of work in uh, Rosamond. Over the past month, uh, staff uh, has held meetings on 7 Standard Road and 43, um, new potential new on-ramps at Truxton and 99, uh, work on State Route 46 in Lost Hills, truck climbing lanes along Route 58, and we continue to participate in um, the Bakersfield Chamber's B3K efforts. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. I'd, it wasn't clear on 119. What exactly is that project? So the the, the project is a, a pavement rehabilitation project, but this project will go uh, a lot further than a typical pavement rehabilitation. It will add sidewalks, add curb and gutter, um, and add drainage facilities. If you if you're familiar with the ar area now, with there's just dirt shoulders through the business area. Um, so what what are the limits? How how from uh, Ash Road all the way to 99, so uh, it will uh, completely change the. So uh, it'd be it full width, full improvements from Ash to 99. Yes, sir. Great. Any other questions? Hearing none, we will adjourn that meeting and move to the. Cog agenda, same roll call. And do we have any public comments? I see none here. We don't have any. Consent agenda opportunity for public comment. I see none here. Any members wish to pull any? Consent agenda items for separate consideration. Hearing none, I'll take a motion. So moved. Garcia, second. Uh, Garcia for the motion, and I was. And Blades. Blades was second. Garcia second. Roll call vote, please. Kyle Blades. <coughs> Kyle Blades. Aye. Daniel Borelli. Yeah. John Crump. Yes. Alex Garcia. Aye. Sally Gonzalez? Aye. Orchel Cryer? 
Here. Kathy Prout. Yes. Zach Scrivener. Aye. Bob Smith. Yes. Philip Smith. Yes. And Veronica Vasquez. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item four, public hearing, Kern Cog fiscal year 2021-22 financial plan, Mr. Palomo. Good evening, Chairman Smith and members of the board. This is the third and final time that you'll see this budget leading to tonight's approval. This budget provides funding for everything that was in the overall work program that was approved on the consent agenda. This year's revenues of about 7.9 million are up about 17% over last year's budget. And this is the first time that I can recall that state revenues are actually higher than federal revenues for our agency. Um, we have some state housing and community development funds to use this year. We have state highway safety improvement program monies. We have California Energy Commission uh, money, as well as SB1 sustainable communities formula and competitive grants. And switching over to expenditures, our staffing level will stay about the same but the biggest increase will come in the object classification of professional services. And all those revenue sources that I just mentioned will have uh, direct benefits to all of your, or uh, most of your member agencies. The housing and community development monies will go towards housing and planning needs and planning needs in your communities. The uh, highway safety improvement program is providing for local road safety plans in a number of communities. The CEC monies are providing um, electric vehicle charging stations in a number of your communities. So that's all good news for the locals. Um, that concludes my brief um, report. I will try to answer any questions if you have any. If not, I'd like to ask that the board uh, conduct a public hearing and then approve the 21-22 budget. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Any public comments? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing and ask for a motion to adopt the final current. Gonzalez motion. Grout second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Aye. Hearing no opposed. Motion carried with the voice vote. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, item five, public hearing, Kern Motorist and Authority Fiscal Year 2021-22 Financial Plan. Mr. Palomo again. Yes, sir. Um, this is the Motorist Aid Program. It's funded by a fee collected from all of our vehicle registrations. We're projecting about $770,000 in revenue for the coming year. And the two biggest focuses as far as expenses, expenses, excuse me, will be the maintaining of our 511 or traveler information program. And then as was talked about a little earlier, uh, the litter pickup. We have increased funding for litter pickup for the 21-22 year provided that the designated agencies can show and actually use the extra funding. So with that, that's my even uh, briefer report on Kern Motors Aid Authority and I'd ask for you to have, hold another public hearing. Thank you, I will open the public hearing for comments. Seeing none, hearing none, I will close the public hearing. Any comments from committee members? I would just comment that uh, I am excited, more money for litter pickup, and, and it's a great program, and I'm glad we can continue it. So can I get a motion to adopt? So moved. This is Kyle Blitz. Gonzalez, second. Thank you. Voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? 
Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman and board members. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, you just talked about uh, litter pickup program, and I just wanted to uh, congratulate and, and remind the board that we started this program back in 2013, and we're uh, really sticking our neck out uh, dealing with an, an issue that has now spread to the rest of California. And as you heard earlier from uh, Michael Navarro, the governor uh, is essentially proposing uh, to do what we've been doing since 2013 statewide. Um, if his uh, legislature agrees with him, um, he will spend $1.5 billion on, on doing what uh, this board uh, authorized us to do back in 2013. So congratulations to all of you who were involved with, with that decision. and. Uh, the great example it has set for the rest of the state and country, actually. I have a few items on this agenda other than that. Um, over the last month, we've I met with uh, CalCog, had a meeting with uh, the COG directors throughout the state and the elected officials. There will be another one of those on May 25th. And on June 25th, just a reminder, the multi-agency working group for housing, that is uh, Chairman Smith, um, Mayor Prout and Supervisor Scribner, you have a meeting scheduled. That committee may take on significantly more responsibilities if, um, the, if what the governor is proposing in his uh, May revise is agreed to by the legislature. He's proposing significant more money flow through that committee f um, for, for housing implementation, not just housing planning, as has. Um, gone on before. Uh, tomorrow is Bike to Work Day, and I'd like to encourage everyone to ride their bike to work, those of you that are going to work. Um, bike Bakersfield will be ho hosting several commuter stands along the Kern River Parkway between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., and we hope you'll consider supporting their cel celebration by getting out to enjoy the beautiful weather and visiting um, the commuter support stations. I'd also like to welcome back and thank uh, the gentlemen who are here tonight but are behind closed doors from Kern uh, Government Television. This is the first uh, meeting that we've uh, taped and televised uh, since March of 2020. Uh, and I, I have to say the audio and video are uh, much better than it has ever been. Here in, here in the room, we are hearing everyone who's online or called in um, through, the through uh, not the telephone anymore, but through the speakers, thanks to Keiko. So thank you very much for that. In your folder uh, this evening, there are two um, certificates of recognition that um, I accepted on behalf of Kern Cog at the groundbreaking that I believe Mr. Navarro mentioned for uh, Route 46 in Lost Hills. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Smith, Supervisor Couch, Congressman Valadeo, uh, former Congressman Thomas, and uh, former Mayor McFarland, uh, Manuel Cantu, who were all in attendance with about uh, maybe 40 other people. It was very well attended. The project is uh, long, long overdue, and it's great to see that fi uh, project finally under construction. Also in your folder this evening is a timeline covering May to August, schedule of cash disbursements for April, and uh, with that, that concludes my report. A subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Hearing none, any member statements? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all.